Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the, the NASA Alumni League first Thursday virtual program of today. It's February the 3rd, 2022, and I'm uh, Stokes McMillan. Uh, today, our speaker is going to be Jim Oberg. Uh, most of us are very familiar with him. He's a NASA Alumni League member and uh, space consultant and, and general expert in Russian space program. So Jim was uh, loaned to NASA by the, the Air Force in 1975, and then he homesteaded at JSC. He was on console for the first shuttle liftoff 40 years ago, and later worked prox hops and rendezvous missions, then finished his NASA work in the, in the mid 1990s, designing the ISS orbit and the first shuttle link up to the first Russian module. He made a special study of the secrets of the Soviet space program and wrote books and consulted with major news media teams. He's always been fascinated uh, uh, by the Russian space program and, and, and now the North Korean space program. And he's gonna tell us all about that, his visit to the North Korean launch site. So Jim, uh, let me hand it over to Jay, Jim Oberg. Take it away, Jim. Thanks, Stokes, and hello, everybody. We, uh, we live in a technology where we're inundated with information and where we work and, and too much. But on the visit to North Korea, I, I was definitely in the opposite situation. They control the information flow very, very rigidly. And because they were so good at making people over there obey them, they thought it was because they were clever and they, and they were persuasive. And they just couldn't understand when they were telling us things about their space program that we didn't believe. That they couldn't understand why we were, we were so disobedient. Lucky sometimes we didn't get shot, but uh, we didn't get into big arguments after a while. We'll, we'll, we'll show you some examples of that. The main thing we were looking for is about traces of military application or origin of their what they were they were promoting as a civilian space program. And the final answer was that they're they're doing this program out of military developed hardware as, as we had done. But uh, after several launch failures and uh, several more attempts got things into orbit and payload failures, it's been five years since they put anything else in orbit and they've lost interest. It turns out, I think we're gonna, and I concluded that for the most part, it was just an ego boosting exercise for the Kim dynasty. And they spent enormous scads of money on, on these things. Uh, never got anything practical out of it. And uh, that's a tragedy for the people in North Korea. For us, it's a matter of an interesting puzzle. So I got over there with NBC News. They had, uh, I had heard uh, that the North Koreans had, had, uh, had uh, said they're gonna invite a team to watch the next satellite launch. Exactly their words, watch the launch. And uh, to prove that it was non-military in nature. Uh, I wanted to get to go, I was looking for some media client to do it, but my regular client was NBC and they were always my, my, my primary client. So they called me the next day and said that they had a long meeting and they decided to go ahead and uh, send a crew over there. And they said, that, would do you think I'd be interested in going with them? And of course he said that with a, with a twinkle in his eye because they knew that the answer was yes. And sure enough, we did. And we got there, looked around, saw things, saw what we didn't see. In other words, things that we all knew should have been there, but wasn't. Didn't embarrass ourselves or get into trouble like other people have done over there and got out and talked about it. And it's, it was one of the most, one of the greatest two week adventures I've ever been on. So there's the picture in the front and they gave me a pass. So there's a shot of me and the director of the satellite control center uh, talking about technology, talking about what was going on uh, with, uh, with the satellite. The satellite is on the pad behind us on the, on the wall screen, ready to launch several days in the future. And uh, we're that close. Later on, or earlier than that, we, the picture in the upper left is at the actual launch center where we got much closer than this picture. We got within, within uh, probably slingshot range of the rocket. Uh, we'd been within spitball range of the payload about an hour before that. So let's go to the next slide and see what we, we and we'll work our way through the slides. Okay, well, I gotta wait. 
Yeah, we don't have the slides, the slides being shared yet. Okay. Well, we'll keep talking. Oh, hang on. Hang on. Let me figure out how to do this. We're rocket scientists you now. We... Yeah. I, I last last time we spent I spent fifteen minutes trying to trying to get this thing. Yeah, I'm sorry. I thought you were going to share your screen. Well, I couldn't I couldn't find the file. But, okay, uh, uh, yeah, I thought someone sent it to you though. But well, they did, and, and, but then somebody said they're going to, you're going to do it. Okay. Well, I don't now. I don't see the option on my screen to share it anymore. Sorry, everyone. I I not get it. I'm, I'm looking to get mine here. I had it a while ago, but it's not coming up anymore. Well, let me see if I can find mine here. Ah, okay. Wait a minute. Okay. Right. Is everyone now seeing it? Oh, got it. I see it. Okay. Okay. On to the page one. All right, let's go ne next page. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Go. Okay. No Even getting into the uh, the country, it, it took a lot of, a lot of arrangement here. Uh, they not only asked us uh, to declare all the money we're bringing with us and stuff, but all the ammunition and explosives and uh, healing devices and uh, narcotics and poisons that we're carrying. We had to declare the poisons. Number three is the interesting one. They ask about GPS or any kind of navigation system. Now the cell phones, they, 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 they knew they could handle. What they didn't realize at the time was that this is in 2012, the high-end wristwatches already had GPS. They apparently had no clue. It wasn't me who did it. I wanted to stand, but somebody over there had their, had their, their wristwatch going when we got to the various sites and took very careful notes of where exactly the sites were. That's one of the other cases where our technology went, made an end, end run around their secrecy. It's not something we would have tried, would we, our group would have tried because that was clearly breaking the, the, the spirit of their, of their legal system. And whether it's legal, illegal or not, they would, you know, people would have wound up uh, in deep trouble. Whoever they did it, they weren't caught. And uh, uh, good for them. Next slide. When we traveled, I, there was a four-man team that went uh, for NBC. There was Richard Engel, who was the leader of the team. He's still, in fact, he's over there now in the Middle East getting shot at, as he's, ha as he's been done for the last 10 years. We had a producer and a cameraman, so and, and me. So it's four of us. We didn't have the kind of links that you normally have when you're in a foreign country where you, you can just send our signals out. Anything we, we did live or recorded had to go out through the North Korean uh, communication system where they watched what it was. They watched the video that was being transmitted from their country. There was no way you could transmit video without them monitoring. Uh, and uh, that, again, was an issue that uh, could have bitten us badly in a few minutes. I'll tell about that. There we are at the at the airport, including the, the cart was a check item as well, because there's no reason to suspect anyone's got a cart of that size uh, when we arrive. Next slide. 
we got into Pyongyang and the first thing we saw on the horizon, it's not a rocket. That's supposed to be the world's tallest hotel. It was being built by Soviet money back when the Soviets had money to throw around. When they quit, when they collapsed, the, the government was over there was, was stuck with a, with a half finished structure. Uh, over the years, it settled, things settled, elevator shafts got out of position. Uh, various international groups were asked to estimate what it would cost to uh, complete. And the groups said that there's no use completing, that the structure is already too unsound uh, to, uh, to be even repaired and just start over again. Well, this was a, a project for the Kim family. They weren't going to do that. They're still working on it. But in the process, whenever there is uh, pictures or, or events going on in Pyongyang, official events, this object is never in the background. Uh, because it, when you ask about it, it's invisible. It's it's uh, it, people just don't see it, or and of course they do, but they just pretend they don't see it because it's an embarrassment to the government. That's a, a cultural system, cultural uh, approach that also applies to their space program. Next, one thing that in terms of keeping secrets. So we are at, at a hotel a far, for foreigners, the Yangokdo Hotel. It's on an island in the middle of the river in Pyongyang. Uh, it's, it's an island and there's barbed wire fences around it, supposedly to protect us, but, but to keep us in. They even they even lock the doors at night, and they, uh, uh, including the emergency doors, uh, just to keep people from sneaking out. One of the crazy features about this hotel is that if you look on the elevator list here, it skips the number five. And it turned out, turns out that that fifth floor is a highly interesting location. If you're trying to keep it secret, why not put a five and it doesn't work instead of leaving a five blank and make everyone wonder what's on that floor. And people have gone there. Next slide shows other tourists who decided to go take a look. Uh, it, first thing we notice is that the ceilings are low. It's a double floor. Although it's, it's, a, it's a five, there's probably a 5A and 5B. Uh, and when, when it's not always staffed by people, but the impression people got was that that was where the monitoring uh, staff was. The military people kept coming in to listen to the Americans or foreigners or even visiting Chinese in the rooms. The assumption was we we're being monitored everywhere. And it was one that took my other associates uh, some getting used to. It's just it's not something you think about uh, when you grow up grow up in the West. So the posters appear to be part of the fact that if they're listening to us, any any human being is going to develop a, a relationship or even a sympathy for the person they're spying on. They were every day in these in this position being indoctrinated to hate all foreigners. Uh, even the kids would, would be in that position. We would see groups of kids in the street up to a certain age. I would make believe I was a basketball player because of my giant height and bounce the ball, throw it, to the, throw, throw it to the hoop. And the kids under the age of six would laugh out loud. They thought it was really funny. About the age of eight, I'm just guessing at the age, they had just had fear in their eyes whenever they see us on the street. They, they, they had the fear that we were going to grab them and stab them to death right in front of the, everyone else. And that's, that's where they begin their education of the world. Next slide. In terms of whether or not it's a military threat to have a space program, the, the North Korean approach is, is kind of uh, insane because although they say their rockets are peaceful, all the pictures they have of their rockets, most of them are of the rockets uh, dropping nuclear weapons on on, Wash, on, the, on the capital on, on Washington, D.C. And these are just two of the kind of posters that they would have on the walls of buildings. They would have them outside on placards, some big placards, 20 feet high. Uh, people driving down the street, well, not driving, but walking down the street uh, would see them. So sure enough, what they're telling their people is they're, they're making these this, this hardware uh, in order to be able to destroy America if, if we uh, misbehave. Next slide. There's just some more posters on the street. 
where they're demanding rockets. Now, they, in this case, those are the satellite launch vehicles behind these guys, and they've still got the fist up in the air, and they want to have the rockets, uh, you know, for peaceful purposes. Well, that they they had a real tough sell to make after we saw enough of these posters driving through the city. Next slide. We are there as part of the launch itself, and this is another major feature of this event, uh, that it was in the 100th anniversary of, the, of Kim Il-sung's uh, birth. He was the first of the, the, the Kim dynasty. And so it was celebrating his, his, his 100th birth. They, the calendar over there begins with the year, year one is when he was born. And we were in the year 100 that they, on their official calendar. Uh, they certainly don't use the Christian calendar. So they, uh, he, he is the, the be all and the end all of that culture. He and his son, Kim Jong-il, uh, who, who died suddenly a few months prior to our trip, leaving a very young Kim Jong-un uh, very young, but but very, but very uh, chubby, uh, and very cruel, as it turns out. Uh, new dictator. Uh, people were flying in from all over the world to from and from countries where they organized North Korea or, or not North Korea, but Korean friendship societies. And the people who were involved figured that, that they'd be, they may have been communists in their own country, or they may have been on the outs. But when they got to North Korea, they'd be treated royally. And sure enough, each of these person there is probably having enough food in, in one meal to feed a, a North Korean for, for a, a week. Uh, there they are filling up there. And there's the people we saw there. I had several encounters with them and did not bother to get into any arguments. Next slide. The first trip was to go to the, the, uh, the launch site. And uh, we did it by trains, about three, several, a five hour trip actually, uh, northeast, northwest from Pyongyang. And as we're driving, uh, riding up there, we were in the, in the food car. The food trays there is, is, is interesting. Uh, they're actually the same food trays that we got on the airplane from Beijing. And they clearly are manufactured in China. And then they're pre presented here to, uh, uh, to the foreign guests. Uh, what you're seeing on the lower left-hand picture is another bizarre scene as the train, and it's a, it's a very deluxe looking train and clearly for VIPs. The folks out there working in the fields uh, realize that is the kind of people on that train and they line up. They line up at, 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 at either at attention or give a slight bow as we went by to the people in that train, because it could have been Kim, it could have been Kim Jong Un or somebody else who, you know, who would just want that kind of thing. Uh, I did throw some of those packets out the window, uh, going through a village, uh, unopened packets, and I hope and I presume that whoever found them realized that if they were going to eat the food, they should get rid of the packaging because the packaging alone would be proof of their treason. If they if they were found it, been, they might go ahead and plant the packaging on somebody else they didn't like. But it was, imagine having a plastic dish as, that you shouldn't have access to be a, be a lifelong or, or prison sentence. Next slide. Let's take the team. There's Richard Engel and uh, uh, working with him, a delightful uh, guy. He's really got his head on straight. And he also puts his body out into the hazardous areas. There are most of the stories in the Middle East. We told stories uh, in the hotel at night, and if half of them are true, and I think most of them are true, uh, he's been more than once been at the where where, where things where people were going to kill him if other if other things hadn't happened. We can get into that later on. Next slide. And the fact that he knew this had been in these kind of dangers reflected on a comment he made in a, in a, a, from the hotel that uh, is very important to make if realizing the sense of our trip. We got here to the, 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 the large site, Sohai, they call it, it's northwest of Pyongyang. And in it, there are several features there. The three circles, the lower left-hand circle, as it turned out, is a vehicle assembly building. The upper, upper left circle is, a, is the launch control center. 
and the rightmost circle is the launch pad itself. If you follow the, the, tra the trail further out past the launch pad, there is, a, you can see a static, a tire, a tower. Uh, it's, it, it, it's not quite a launch site. It's an engine test facility. And they also use that vehicle, that facility for testing heat shields. They just fire, the, fire a test engine with a heat shield 50 feet below it, and they get all the heating and stress that they, that they need to validate the, the, uh, the reentry vehicle's heat shield. We didn't see any of that. We got to go into all three of these buildings and, uh, and look around and take pictures. Next slide. This is all now five days before the launch, it's turned out. It's a long way up there, and I'm already you know, getting in the late 60 there, so I, I was taking my time. What's interesting about the area here, these ditches were actually that the, uh, the southern edge of those ditches still had snow in them. It was still cold enough that, the, that, that it would be snowing and the snow would last through the day. You don't see it here because that, that's the sun facing side of it. But as we'd walk along those roads and you can see people way back in the background, they're heading, they're moving ahead to get to the rocket. Uh, they're seeing the same thing, the ditches, the snow, and uh, nothing else is green around there except a couple of trees on top of the hill and that rocket. Next slide. Next. Okay. The, uh, Lost it. So this is the on. first time that people had gotten, foreigners had gotten here. And as far as I could tell, it's been the last. They were concerned about whether, there we go. One of the features I used that really impressed them was a model made for me by uh, another, a NASA engineer, Mark Lardis, who is who's also into uh, book writing and, 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 and modeling. It's actually a paper model, but I kept it in a, in a, uh, in a cylinder and uh, we would use it. They were impressed by it. And you can see that uh, compared to the real one, it's pretty high fidelity, but we kept it out there as a prop and we're the only ones who had it. And it was definitely, I'm sure it freaked out their security people uh, because they would not know of any way we could legally have found out what the, what the rocket looked like, except it turned out they have released pictures. Uh, but that's hard to explain if they're on your case. So I, uh, you know, it was fun to bring. Uh, it was risky and I didn't realize how risky because I didn't realize how crazy uh, the, the regime or the security teams were. Next slide. What we do with the pictures, and I took I and I I just photographed the heck out of everywhere I was, not just what was in front of us, but I do a full 360 several times just to get the things behind us, because those were some interesting things as well. And we could use the pictures, like the one on the right that I got, uh, to come and compare that with officially released pictures. Uh, on the left is the launch pad for the first two satellite attempts. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, about, it's a smaller rocket and a much smaller gantry tower. So we're, now we're in, in the right-hand side, the one that we saw, it's, uh, it's a gantry tower that's certainly built to accommodate even bigger rockets. And the, uh, the size that it could handle was one of the things that was interesting to try and deduce from what, we're, what we were seeing. Okay, the issue with the first two satellites they launched back in the, uh, way back in the, in the, in the 80, uh, 90s, they, they both failed. They neither of them got into orbit, but they didn't dare tell uh, Kim Jong-il. So he was told that but not only was it, uh, uh, they were in orbit and they played the re recordings of the national anthem that were being relayed by the satellites, so they said. They got people together in the evening time crowds filling town squares and told that the satellite was passing overhead as they played this song over loudspeakers. And sure enough, people in the, in the crowd looked up and pointed to the sky and ooh, nah, ooh, nod. And they knew that if they didn't do that, uh, it would be, be a bad situation. So they all pretended they were seeing the satellite. The, the, the bizarre thing is that even the workers that we met uh, insisted the satellites had worked and, and they must have known that we knew they were lying 
but they just couldn't they couldn't in front of anyone else uh, go back on on the initial on the initial claims. This launch would, would have been their third satellite to reach orbit, and as it turned out, uh, you, as we'll find out, it did not either. Next slide. Our advantage we had in the trip was that by this time, uh, again, about 10 years ago, 10 or 20 years ago, there was a lot of on-orbit imagery, uh, commercial imagery, unclassified imagery becoming available. A picture that uh, on the left-hand side there, upper left, of what was turned out to be their assembly building, which was improperly identified by most analysts uh, that, that, that beforehand, uh, that the pavement in front of the building from from walking it walking into it from the, uh, the crossroads you see in the lower in the lower right part of the picture the pavement turned from white to black uh, over between March 20th and March 31st 2012 which was a few days before we were going to arrive there and sure enough when we got there they could tell that it had turned to black because they'd put a new covering on it for some reason uh, it wasn't even clear why they were doing it, uh, but that that was the first of many build of building changes and, and structural changes that I would run into that really could I make I could make no sense out of it. But they did that on several of their buildings, just changing the color around the building, changing the, the nature of the pavement around the buildings. Next slide. So if you're getting the view that they're irrational and crazy. Gets, there's that's just the beginning. This is the other building we eventually got to. It was a, a third thing on our vi our visit. First was the assembly building, and then the launch pad, and then this building, which was the satellite co satellite control center, behind a fence, as you see, and down below, uh, there's the crowd, and the crowd is uh, uh, circling around an official over on the left hand side. There's a taller guy in a camel jacket heading for the door. With white pants on, right there in the middle, and you can—that's that, as you can tell—is me. Uh, I wasn't looking at the—I wasn't ever looking at what they were telling me to look at. I was looking in other directions, and I got away with it. Next slide. That's an official uh, Communist Party paper, uh, photograph, by the way. In the this is the Launch Control Center, and. With our familiarity with control centers, you look at that and you got to scratch your you scratch your head. Uh, they're they're looking at screens, but they're about three feet or from the screens. Uh, they they've got a keyboard that they can't reach. They've got no no headsets. They have all the telephones of, of each each table in a, in a pile in the, in the upper right hand corner. Very very neat, and ergonometrically. Uh, Silly, but uh, that's that was supposed to be what we were looking at. You can see the people down there taking pictures are official government people. So I had to, I, but I got a lot. Of, still, a lot of their pictures were useful. We were up in a, in a viewing gallery, looking looking down at it, getting pictures like this, and, and I got I got I got dozens more. Uh, was a. a a reference, a reference to the way these things are constructed in April of 2013. But it turned out that this stuff was all apparently props because the next time people visited this, official visited this place for the next satellite launch, they had an entirely new set of consoles, an entirely new set of controllers. And, and but they published pictures of that as well. And I'll show you some comparisons when we get to the end. That really suggested that this is all just a show. Uh, they, did launch a, they did launch a rocket and eventually they got two of them into orbit. Uh, so it's not entirely fake, but all this kind of stuff we were being shown and I didn't realize until I see, saw the later pictures how... A fakery is a hard word to say, but how misleading and how unusual their facilities were. Next slide. Well, after we had, uh, this is ahead of getting out of sequence here, but we've also visited 
the uh, their mission control center. And that's the one that uh, a few days later, that's the one that's uh, northeast of Pyongyang. We, we went, went on a bus ride. And again, nobody else had uh, ever, no foreigners had ever been there. Uh, when I, I, on the trip out there, I did what I normally do in some of these strange places, which is log the turns. I'll sit, I'll sit uh, up front, I'll, I'll keep a log book of uh, left and right turns and, and timing and so forth. So we can go back later on with Google Earth and get pictures that show the streets and the intersections with sufficient uh, sharpness that you could then plot out where, oh, that must be the turn. And you work it, and if you get the next turn right, then you know it was the, it was the right choice. So I was going to do a very laborious uh, uh, process to determine where the site was. But the day after we got back from a, a news a, a space newsletter in, in uh, Washington D.C., published the latitude, and longitude, and that overhead picture, which they've gotten, and uh, I'm sure that they, the North Koreans. And no, had no idea how, how and why or how that happened, but clearly, not having checked things like wristwatch GPS systems, they um, they were caught by surprise. Next slide. Here's me in the in the front. The kind of things I was doing, and here's an official photograph. KCNA is the is the Korean, uh, well, I call it the Korean uh, Commie News Agency, but uh, it's their it's their national news agency. And uh, they took pictures of people standing around, admiring the, the facilities, admiring the personnel. And once in a while, they'd catch me in the back, looking in the wrong direction. So the, the speaker, he's the center director, and he is uh, talking. And he, I'm sure he didn't notice at all. I just put the caption in there for funny, but they would certainly wonder what I was doing. They never came up to me and never approached me, never cautioned me. And I was with a news delegation, which I thought gave me and did, it turned out to accurately, give me an, an, a, a, quite a bit amount of protection. But there's definitely gonna be a, a limit that I, 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 I tried and succeeded in staying on the right side of it. Never did get feedback from the security people. Next slide. That's what I was looking at. And I'm the only guy on the trip who got a picture of it. One feature of that facility was you, that you have to be linked in. They were they had live pictures of uh, of the launch pad, and we were at that point several hundred miles from, from, from the launch site, so they had good communications. And uh, this is the kind of gear that was was providing that. Next slide. Now I asked the director some things. Here's, again, I'm looking in the wrong way, taking taking pictures. The director wanted me to sit with him because he heard I, I was I was at, uh, from NASA. They made clear I was not a NASA representative. In fact, no longer was with NASA, but I was a, supposedly you know, a real rocket scientist, and he he was very proud to show off his facilities to us. I had a chance to ask him some questions, and when you uh, when you go into a situation like that. We have no idea how much they were they think is wrong and how much they're gonna to lie to you about it. You start out with by calibration. You start out by giving by asking questions you know the answers to, uh, but pretend you don't and uh, see see how close you came. He passed that test. I asked him, for example, looking at the launch site, going to polar orbit south from this launch site, uh, the earth rotates eastward. By the, time, by the time the satellite comes around, you'll be out of communications. How long will it be after launch when you'll get the first confirmation of being in orbit? And he, he thought about it briefly and he said, well, he said 11 hours, which is what I calculated the night before. It's a, a, a wait until you've orbited, you turn halfway around and catch the satellite coming from the south and you get one or two compasses. Now, the, that took a little bit, there was a hiccup there because the interpreter who's talking there uh, said 12 hours. And uh, I know that because part of the preparation I like to do when I travel to strange places around the world, or Kazakhstan or other, other places, is to pick up a 
a jot list of 50, 100, maybe 200 words, words and phrases that I make, I make use of. Like I'm an American, where's the embassy kind of thing. No, but uh, basically I am a historian. I'm very interested in this place. Um, and uh, you ask questions or words about uh, who, what, where, when, and you ask numbers. And uh, so I had memorized the numbers from one to 20 in Korean. Uh, I still, I can't do it now, but I, it was part of the trip I, I did 10 years ago. And when he, when the director said 11 hours, the interpreter said 12. And I looked back at the director and I said, uh, are you, are you 11 hours, right? And I don't know if I spilled the beans there or not, because one of the advantages you have when you use this gimmick is that for, especially in places like Korea, they'll basically assume you have no clue about their language. And uh, I found this worked uh, a lot even with the Russians. When I met with the Russians, and whenever we met with a new group who had met me before, I could see him muttering to others, on on Ruski. He, he speaks Russian. D warning, don't talk Russian in front of this guy. I don't speak it that well. I can hear it a lot. But they suddenly caught on that I understood some Korean. Uh, that may have been a foolish, uh, a foolish uh, revelation, but again, they, they did not bother me over it. Next slide. The same guy, by the way, before, uh, we won't go back, stay where you are, but uh, I had debated, I asked him why, you know, what was really being launched? We, we saw the satellite in the assembly building. You know, on a on a on a, uh, on a on a base a wheeled base and they said they're gonna they're gonna load it tomorrow the next day and launch it the day after that which is unusual speed and I suggested to the director that the uh, control center mission control center that we, we that we don't see any real evidence that 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 peaceful object is what's on the underneath the launch shroud of the rocket and the booster on the, on the pad that we can see in your TV monitoring. We don't know what's underneath that large shroud. We have not seen that satellite you showed us get loaded onto the rocket. And uh, he, he got exasperated because he, he waved, it, waved me off several times. And finally he said, Mr. Oberg, do you want us to put a chair under, on, on the rocket and you can, you can ride into space with it? And uh, which I immediately said, of course, that would be, that would be great. Uh, but pictures are better. Give us pictures. And he said, well, we will, I'll send you pictures. And I gave him my hotel, my room number. And I said, well, he said, we'll send the pictures. I'll, we'll send you pictures. And I just looked look straight at him and I, and I said, uh, Inja, the Korean word for, for when. Well, it totally not, blew the head off my interpreter. And he spoke English back to the, the uh, Korean guy. Where, uh, when uh, the, the, no one seemed to notice that we'd suddenly reversed languages there, and got back on track real soon. The, the director said, "Oh, it's it will do it right away," he, and they never did. We never saw any indication that the satellite that we were shown uh, was on the booster that we that we saw launched, or we, we, that that was launched. We didn't actually see it. It turned out, but uh, that was one of the major gaps. Of, of the information that they were trying, the point they're trying to make is that they they didn't really show us what they should have expected any real newsman to ask about. Like, what's, what, did you really put this object on that particular rocket? One of the features of the control center and the picture you're seeing here above the GSCC, the General Satellite Control Center is the director and me in our discussion and half the room while trying to try to listen to our discussion there that was kind of that was kind of uh, enjoyable and uh, going through the talks but this picture I, i've seen plenty of pictures of me what i was interested in was a picture of the consoles the consoles were hollow they basically had a flat screen this is this is 2013 2012 so it's not like they're all laptops uh, they, they probably had a display screen, whether it was real display or whether it was, they had display screens. We could see it in front, uh, but they, uh, there's nothing else, nothing else under the box. 
uh, it, there was, it was this empty space. Next slide. Now, later on, as we're getting closer to launch, one of the things we saw at the control center was that they had data charts, display charts on the front wall. And very, very typical for a, mission, for a control center. So nothing unusual there. What was unusual was the, the plot they had of ascent profile, uh, downrange versus altitude. And it was blank, almost blank. They, uh, they had uh, taken the trajectory, the ascent trajectory off the chart, I'm presuming for our visit, because certainly you can use that sort of information to, to, to differentiate between a typical, a typical ICBM ascent trajectory, high burn, high angle of attack, a high angle of insertion, with a satellite launch, a lofting higher, eventually doing your final burn nearly horizontal. So th there is a difference between a military missile asset profile and a satellite launch uh, that this kind of chart could, uh, could have shown. But they, if they wanted to hide that, which suggests that it was the answer was the one they didn't want us to think. The thing about that was those that they had left the, the uh, plot, the actual graph off, but they left the scale on. They left the 200, 400, 600, 800 kilometer scale on altitude and 500, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 scale on downrange. And it's not very hard to imagine if that is in fact this chart you're making for ascent that your launch is going to be following that a path that fits on that screen. Uh, and you would guess the, uh, the, kind, the kind of profile and the kind of insertion uh, situation you probably have at the end of that because it was that far down range. So it, it, it was not it was not worrisome that uh, the trajectory looked like a satellite launch trajectory. It, was, it sort of did. What was worrisome is that they, uh, they, they wanted to keep that secret because they were scared, I guess, what we might conclude from it. And uh, whenever, you, whenever they kept something secret, you worry that it's going to, because it's something that they don't want us to know. We were going to go out, and, and once we realized what the trajectory was like, we realized that down in Pyongyang, and down in the hotel we were at, that this launch trajectory was going to be in the western sky. In fact, about 40 to 50 degrees elevation from Pyongyang as the rocket went by on its way into orbit. Uh, in the... Uh, question was then, can we watch it? If we know that there's a launch, if we're in the building and, and, they're, and, they're, and they put the TV image up on the wall of the, the countdown, uh, and if there's not a, not a significant time delay and a lot of other ifs, uh, could we get outside in time to just scan the sky? Had we done that, we'd have gotten the most spectacular view ever uh, and unique view ever of what actually happened to the rocket probably would also have been shot. Uh, so it turned out we couldn't do it. They didn't do things live. So we had the plan though. We were ready to go out. Uh, the cameraman and I had, pl had planned to set up in the back of the room, uh, up on a tripod. And when we saw the ignition, we were gonna, he was gonna take the camera off the tripod. We were gonna head out the door. We walked it several times to where that little pink arrow is. And we could do it in about 25 seconds. And uh, he was not even going to set up. He was he was going to look up in the sky. He knew where those buildings across the street were and where the flight path should be. Uh, but we we'd uh, studied that, and uh, we would have done that. Uh, we did not get a chance to do that because, as it turned out, they never showed us the launch uh, delayed or otherwise. All the main promise of the trip uh, disappeared. Uh, probably. Probably it's good for us that, didn't, that we didn't have to do it. Next slide. It probably would have gone across the boundary what they're going to do. There we are in the uh, conference center, uh, and there's a screen up on the wall that uh, where they were going to project the launch for us to see. 
people were sitting around. We the first group that came there the, the week earlier with the trips were only about 80 people. Uh, there's 300 or so here. They began filtering and filling it up in a few days before the actual launch. Uh, our group is over about the two o'clock position in the outer rim uh, on the right there. That's where we sat. Now, the screen was supposed to light up that morning and with a projector in front and show the launch. We're sitting around. We didn't even, we weren't, we weren't even told that was the day. This was the, the birthday though. And there were big parades and big statuary and things were going to be, uh, there were big celebration throughout the city, throughout the country. And uh, which was the perfect day for a launch. Uh, if you're in a communist country and you sell and you use it to celebrate and, and bring on and, and big praise to the, to the leadership. So that was the day that they probably were aiming for. In fact, that may have been the, one of the main reasons that it eventually failed is that they, they had no choice but to, but to try it. And they, as we, as we saw when we visited the places, we saw that they were very much like Mao's little red book. They, they were following the thoughts and leaders and the ideas of Kim Il-sung, and they were doing all their project, you know, with him watching over their shoulder and guiding them. Now, any of them believed it or not, they all pretended to. And uh, you couldn't, you couldn't, for example, say, wait a sec, I don't, I'm not sure about this. Uh, I'm not sure about, this. let's check this again. No, when you're doing this and to honor Kim Il-sung, there, there is divine a divine uh, leadership, divine providence is, uh, is making it work. And they went ahead and launched. We heard about the launch sitting there only by telephone from, uh, from uh, news groups in, in Japan. And uh, within a few minutes, heard about the fact that the U.S. Air Force had been tracking it and announced the rocket had blown up as it had. Next slide. And there we go. We never got a chance to see it, and it and it blocked up. It blew up. The bizarre thing. The next was the real bizarre feature, most bizarre feature, that we were put on buses, which we figured we we're going to go to a press conference about the uh, about the launch. Instead, we were trucked over to a statue unveiling for of Kim Il Sung, and his grandson Kim Jong Un, uh, and they were and Kim Jong Un was there. Uh, probably 200,000 people were in the square, and we were there to help celebrate the centenary of Kim Il-sung. As far as the satellite launch happened, from the moment it blew up, nobody on the entire North Korean delegation and, and teams, teams in front of us, nobody mentioned it. Nobody remembered it. It was like they had not satellite launching. What, what satellite launch? You're here for Kim Jong-un. You're here like with all the other... Uh, North Korean loving people from around the world who have come to feast at our tables and, and celebrate with us. Our plan was that I would be flying out that day, uh, the, whenever the launch date was, we'd get on a plane, fly, fly to Tokyo, and, be, and do the coverage, live co uh, coverage uh, and re reportage from there. Uh, turned out because of, the, of all the tourists there, all, all flights were booked. I, I couldn't None of us could uh, leave the country for three or four more days. So we wound up in, a, in an information vacuum uh, when the information was not, was not made available to us. We'd seen that kind of behavior before. And this is what case in the earlier, a few days earlier, Engel had uh, scared us. Uh, we were doing a live piece. It was early in the, it was in, in the evening our time, but it was for the early morning NBC uh, show. It was going out from our cameras through the control center in, in Pyongyang, uh, and then through this, through a commercial satellite to New York, where it was being broadcast live. We had spent the previous day touring Pyongyang, seeing they're showing us a so-called typical store, which of course they'd arranged us to see ahead of, ahead of time, because it was, it was designed only for the, for the uh, regime people. We had drove, driven around and spotted things that we'd ask about. We spotted things, for example, that the buildings where the regime people lived, you can tell they were, they were, they were, they looked like modern 
apartment buildings, not the hovels that the most folks lived in. Those buildings tended to have cages around the first, second, and third floor balconies, but up to 20, up to 20 floors, just the first three floors. Uh, I noticed that, and I asked Ang mentioned it to Angle. It looks like they're worried about pilferage. They're worried about thievery. Uh, there are people here who are that desperate enough and disobedient enough that they will try to break into the apartments of, of regime people to steal whatever food or valuables they can find. Angle asked our, our, our tour guide about that. So we noticed the funny thing about the, the, uh, the cages, the uh, screens around the, around the balconies. And he says, oh, that, that's to protect the children so that they don't fall, they don't fall out and injure themselves. And, and Engel said, well, and that's why, then why they, aren't they on the higher floors, not on the lowest floors? And the guy just looked, looked out the window. The, the, he just turned away and just looked, looked away. So I'm sure, we baff, I'm sure we broke their hearts and baffled them because we were not being obedient like everyone else over there was. But when they, when they, they pretended to tell the truth, so the other people there will pretend to lie. I... I worry that people in that kind of regime, uh, after after you you lie often enough, your face grows to fit the mask that you have to wear, and that uh, you're not just pretending that you actually are warped by that. Engel saw the same thing, and in the following day, giving, doing a live spot, he said, "We've been seeing the real. We've seen yesterday the reality of life in North Korea. We've seen what it's like for the people." And then he said. This is the kind of world that Adolf Hitler wanted to build if he won the war. So here's me, the cameraman and the producer saying, oh, heck, we're toast. We're toast. I mean, it, that's first is true that what Engel said, but you don't say that over the air and where they're, when they're listening in and, uh, well, I, I packed up some of my stuff in case I had to grab it in the middle of the night. Uh, but it turned out uh, no one ever mentioned it. Not that evening and not the following morning. And at breakfast, uh, we were talking with another journalist who came, came to North Korea a lot and described what happened. Says, Engel said this, and they ignored it. And the uh, veteran journalist said, well, that's not hard to understand. Said, First of all, this is North Korea. Most people here have never heard of Hitler. And he said, those who have would have taken it as a compliment. That's that world. Next slide. Let's go there. One more. And we got to go home. Now, next slide. There was that new launch. This is a good shot of the launch area. Uh, and we'd walked on the pad down below. What I had not shown were some of the pictures we took at the launch pad. One of the features was at the upper left-hand side, they, it was launched, the pad was half again as long as a, as a, as a football stadium. And the, the, sadly, the rocket was on one side, that to the right. And on the left-hand side was, was open, but there, were, there was a first aid tent way down there. There were also rails and the rails were there clearly for a mobile, mobile structure. And sure enough, in the months that followed, they began building a mobile vehicle assembly building uh, on, on the pad and uh, used it for later on for launches. Next slide. Because the rocket failed, that was a boon for all the good guys and a lot of things were picked up. It, it was, it, they were the, they were the, property of the North Korean government. But, uh, and legally they would have every, every right to demand them back. They, I, don't, I can't say what their feelings were about it, but they never made, they never, never requested them. Um, now there was, uh, these uh, events are from uh, the crash, uh, let's see, which, uh, on the first stage, what they what they got from the April crash of the payload, uh, no one's ever said. Next slide. Uh, 
And what began to see what, what, what looking back is, is the realization that with the pictures I had taken and the pictures that were released for later events, such as uh, we were there in April, 2012, and uh, the uh, successful launch was in December of 2012. And these are pictures of the, of the launch control center. Uh, I'm sorry, the pictures of the mission control center from both missions. There's quite a difference. The ones on the upper right hand corner are, are those big fat consoles that turned out to be hollow. If, if, if maybe even that person taking the picture standing in front of the console, you can see you in, in the right hand side of that picture. Their pictures showed the consoles were hollow. They didn't figure out that that meant anything. So they issued those pictures officially. And uh, it's sort of like a phrase from one of my favorite uh, uh, mystery shows, TV shows, police shows, uh, uh, Inspector Lewis, uh, the, the uh, protege of, of Morse. And he had, Lewis had a young man working for him named James Hathaway who would make philosophical questions because he'd been, he'd been a seminary student before he became a, doc, a detective. And the phrase that I liked, and it means so much to the work I do and the fun I have is, is about a clue. He says, what is a clue but somebody else's mistake? And so watching for those mistakes to provide clues has been an enormously uh, interesting. It's a good word for, for me. The uh, view there, again, shows that the consoles were different. They were swapped out. And apparently, between April and December, the consoles from one of the control centers wound up in the other control center. They were, the, they were at least the same shape and same, same size. Uh, you can see also the personnel at those consoles. On the right-hand side, they're all in white coats. And on the left-hand side, uh, six months later, they're military uniforms. The very strong impression about that is that there, it's a it's a charade that these are that these this is all make believe, and it's put on for the sake of of imagery. It's put on in April for the sake of our visits, um, and then later on for 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 television. Next slide. Uh, here's a view from the the launch. Con this is from the launch control center uh, at the at their launch site. Again. On the uh, upper left is the April view where they have flat screens. And the lower right uh, in December, they're, they're in uniform and they're, and they're the big fat screens. Uh, same place. You look at the wall, look at the stuff along the wall. It's the same stuff. They've changed the front display, count, display panels, but the, uh, the doorway is positioned right and so are the air conditioners. The floor is the same, parquet, wood. The control center full of those yellow buttons is the same, but the consoles for the operators are totally re replaced. Next slide. And there's a view looking back. Uh, the uh, April one is one that uh, Korean news agency released and so is the December one. These are not my pictures but they're taken by a person standing in the same place. And you can see the, the difference in the back of the room is the same. You can see the doorway, you can see the ceiling lights, you can see all the structure in the back of the room is the same, but the consoles are different. Next slide. I think we're, we're getting, to, you know, getting toward the end here. I guess, Any yeah. more? No. Okay. Well, it's a good slide to stop at because, the, the, and there are other pictures and probably um, uh, some of my longer presentations, I do a lot more detailed co uh, comparison of between April and December. After the December launch, which got into orbit, first first one, the fourth attempt got into, uh, that we know of, got into orbit and was supposed to take uh, crop survey pictures. Uh, nothing was ever released. No picture was ever released of that from the satellite. Uh, two years later, they made their, their fifth launch. It got into orbit. Uh, but again, nobody in the West ever picked up any radio signals from that payload. 
and uh, no pictures were ever released. The, anx the, the anxious issue here, and that was it. They never launched into orbit again. It's been five, it's been 10 years, well, it's been five years, and uh, they've, they've, uh, they, they quit. They, they got tired of it. There are other things you can do, though, with launching things to orbit, this particular kind of orbit. And, uh, and, and the, it's the one concern I would have, and I published it, and, and, and it's been very well received as an analysis. Well, if you're not going to launch uh, Earth resource, Earth surface res or Earth surface monitoring satellites, which they they never got a single one to work, and they stopped. Why go through it? The first reason probably is just to glorify the Kim regime, because the launch control center that we saw there uh, it, uh, at Sohei, by the time they made their fifth launch. It had been gutted out and it was entirely replaced. The interior was replaced by paintings of Kim, Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-un and models of rockets. It became a museum or a shrine to the Kim regime where it had once been the launch control center for, uh, for the, the rocket. Now, in terms of a launch control center, they built a new one up on the hillside, a little bit, a little bit north of there with a much better view, direct view of the launch pad. And so the entirely new control center was built so that on the day of the launch, Kim Jong-un could stand there and, uh, and, and wave his arms as the rocket took off. Uh, the insanity of that and the immense waste of that and the suffering on the public of that uh, has got to get to you. And, and, and is it all just for show? The answer has got to be, I hope so, because with something in orbit, in that inclination, launch from Sohei, you can put a thousand pound object flying across the coast of Virginia in 65 minutes. You don't need a heat shield. If you've got a, even a 10 kiloton device aboard and you don't even need a timer, you can command it live from the North Korean embassy in Havana. And you might not, if you, if you set this thing off in over international waters, you're not even breaking any law. Uh, fortunately, that we have not seen them run any practice drills doing that. Uh, that 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 is probably an extreme, extreme model, and, but it's something that I've said and other people have echoed that it's it's serious enough that the U.S. should be stationing ships off the coast and any unexpected. So base payload launched out of Sohei into a southern orbit should be shot down. We should we should forbid them to get into orbit without an inspection of what's going up. They have not prepared another launch, and uh, but they have done some other bizarre things at the site. Uh, they when we got we were, when we were there, we walked to the launch pad. All the fuel was being trucked in. When the rockets were being brought up by by. Uh, but trailer tra trains because they, 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 the train track didn't go all the way to the launch pad. You'd have to take them off the train about a mile and a half away, put them on a flatbed and bring it to the launch site and set it up. With that kind of a facility, that was, well, that was the primary reason I looked at that. I said, that's what you do with military missiles. You don't have, a, you, military missiles should be portable. They should be able to be set up anywhere you want, even in, in, between two apartment buildings. You bring it in by truck, you bring the fuel in by truck, and you fuel it and you launch. And that was how they were launching their rockets out of Sohei. Now, later, they did extend the, the train track to the launch pad, and they did apparently put piping out there. But when they extended the train to the launch site, they put covers over it. They have a cover over the train at the, at the assembly building and a covered uh, uh, over the train uh, train track at the launch pad. I've got the pictures of it, and a movable launch platform where they put a move the move the move the uh, vehicle the assembly structure over the end of the the railway. Open the doors, the, the flat flatbed doors. Put the rocket in the assembly building and and then roll it to the launch pad, which no longer is an open pad where you can, as we saw, where you can see the rocket in it. Now it's got doors. So you can't see what's in it. Now they have built a system where they can they can send a rocket 
uh, to the site, put it on launch pad, set it up and be ready to launch. And, and there's nothing you can detect from orbit that they're doing that. And that's the sort of thing that you get to worry about because uh, you tend to design your capabilities to meet your, your intent, your intentions. And there's, uh, there's no conceivable peaceful intention that requires that kind of stealth. And uh, that's my basic answer, or basically what I found, the things I found there, I think, and the things that I didn't see there, which um, made me see it, see, it different, see it differently. I'm going to take a break here, and let's, let's see uh, where we can go with the discussion. But thank you, guys, and uh, glad to have a chance to, uh, to make the presentation. Well, thanks, Jim. That was super interesting. Uh, wow. I mean, I don't think we get a view of the North Korean uh, launch processes, you know, normally. And so you, you kind of opened a window there. I really appreciate that. So, uh, David, why don't you unmute everybody and so see if anyone has any questions for Jim. Hey, yeah, everybody can unmute uh, as you need. Well, Jim, one question I had, what, what did you think of the roads there? you going to the, you know, to and from the facilities you visited. Were they primitive or, or what? Hold on, I got... Later, okay, later. I'm still online. No. <laughs> Okay, I got this. I must have chores to do. Okay, uh, the roads are interesting to look at. The train tracks, the primary train track was was real high quality because that's where the uh, VIPs would go between Pyongyang and Beijing. But the villages along those roads, uh, we took pictures of ox ox drawn horse drawn carriages, carts. People were in the field by hand ditching. And, and and breaking the soil up and getting ready to plant the spring crops. Uh, the It was it was something out of uh, Monty Python on the Holy Grail. So it reminded me of it was just people sitting there in the mud uh, with, with, their, with, their, with the dirty clothes. The uh, roads in the city uh, are, are, are wide and, and, and practically empty and every corner has got some pretty cop, a woman, police, a traffic person directing traffic and every 10 or 15 minutes, something goes by that she can wave to and direct. Uh, people go to work there in, in the backs of, uh, of uh, dump trucks or, or, or trucks, uh, lorries. They don't, the, the dream for the top people there is to get a bicycle. Um, walking down the street in Pyongyang, you can look in the windows of the apartments in the first floor. And as you pass by on the wall facing the, the street, facing the window, was would be a two or three foot square picture of of Kim Jong Un and Kim Il Sung, so looking out, making sure that people walking by saw that you had that picture uh, in your in your living room. Uh, it, we kept seeing the, the absolute degree of of uh, of control, but the fact that they had to put screens around some of the some of the uh, Balconies suggested that that's not total. There are people who defy it. Uh, Jim, this is Gary Johnson. Uh, any indication of what uh, types of propellant they were using in the launch vehicle? I think uh, we, we saw it was pretty much hypergolic. Uh, and uh, again, that's a more of a military issue than, than, uh, than a, I. I I have some notes on that. I can look it up, but it was it was a fairly standard hypergolic uh, mix. Oh, okay. All right, thanks. Jim, this is James Ortiz. Uh, did they ever mention to you any desire or goal for a human space uh, program? Well, that's very interesting because if you look at the fact that the well, not the fact, but if you look at the indication that the entire program exists for the ego of the dictator, then about ten years ago, when the Russians were preparing to carry a South Korean uh, astronaut into orbit, 
I, I really just thought they would put somebody on top of a rocket and shoot them up, just up and down, uh, just to do it first. The fact that they would that they actually allowed South Korea to put a person into space, in fact, into orbit, uh, and without actually sh shooting someone up or claiming to have shot someone up, uh, surprised me, because uh, the model I have of the intentions of the program which is glorification of the regime, glorification of the leadership. Uh, that was something that they, they would have done. But uh, other than that, there's, there's no reason to do it now that the South Koreans have done it. Uh, there's no, it was, it's no good. And if they did it now, they'd come, they would be a clear second. Uh, uh, there's, there's, they're not gonna go up with uh, the Russians. That, they, that way it may have been too expensive. The other, everyone else went up. They, Remember back in the 70s, the Russians had a bunch of intercosmos cosmonauts, one each from all their Warsaw, back, Warsaw bloc countries. And um, one of the features of that was that they launched them in Czechoslovakia, East Germany, Poland. And then they went down through the second order of, of uh, Bulgaria, Romania, Mongolia, Vietnam. And they, uh, you could tell that was a stunt because the uh, second group of about seven bloc countries that were launched, one each, uh, it was launched in alphabetical order. Yeah, but you gotta you gotta know what the names of the countries are in in Cyrillic in Russian to re to recognize that. Uh, then when I mentioned that in print, people said, "What do you mean uh, Vietnam doesn't come ahead of Hungary?" I said, uh, "In Cyrillic, it does. V is the third letter." <laughs> oh boy! So I'm surprised that they hadn't done that. Uh, I would not be surprised if they tried and failed and just uh, kept it quiet. I have Thank a you. question. Well, I have a, a thought of, about that. I think that this is Mary Saramelli. I think that uh, it's possible that they wouldn't want to launch a North Korean because that person then would temporarily at least have a higher and maybe more heroic profile than Kim Jong un. So, awesome. what about the, after that fact, I mean, they don't want to elevate, uh, you know, somebody above Kim Jong Un. That's uh, probably a regime. That's that was certainly uh, be something people would notice. He'd become a national hero, right? Uh, a paramount national hero. The other uh, possibility, the other issue is the um, uh, an old Russian joke. I'm talking about way back when, when we were both in, I'm sure, in eighth grade or before that. Uh, the Russians were going to be launching a cosmonaut. Uh, this is before they had. And uh, the point was made, well, they, they, they've got to have a two-man space capsule. And so they, they, it being a joke now. And someone said, well, why do you need a two-man space capsule? He said, well, the Russians never let any one person get out of the country without someone else to go, go with them and watch them. You can joke about the Russians. North Koreans, there's no making fun of the situation the people are in there. It is, it is ghastly. Yeah, I'm amazed that you were able to throw some food out of the train. I would think that they, they would have gotten you in trouble for that. Well, they, they, I was, I looked and saw, see, if, see if there are any cameras monitoring it. I knew, we knew that they were monitoring our rooms. And the same was true over in Russia. And we would sit in, 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 the, in the dining area and talk about things, fully realizing that, that everything we were saying was going to be uh, translated and, 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 and taped, or we were at least assuming um, that it was going to be, be done. So we, we would, if we can go outside or, or sit on a bus or something for anything special, but we just knew that the conversations had better not be uh, revealing too much. The same was true in, in, in Russia when I was with the various groups uh, in the, in the uh, 80s and 80s, and even still the 90s. And things were being monitored. Your 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 wastebasket in your room was being inspected. You know, anything you threw out was going to wind up on the security people, people's desk the, you know, the next following morning. And so many people uh, in the West just don't realize, don't imagine this level of of uh, of a surveillance. Um, I was with uh, 
Rick Burnett, we're, we're going to do a, a Survivor Space uh, series, and we're heading on a tour of Red Square and uh, to a walking tour, and he spotted me tossing tossing things into the trash cans along the street, and uh, he asked me what they were. I said that those are the rough notes of our me meeting yesterday. I, I recopied them overnight, and I have the recopied version here in my pocket. And he said, well, don't you have a wastebasket? And I said, yeah, but uh, it's for rent. You put it in the wastebasket, someone's going to read it. And he, they're just shocked. People, Americans are, Americans are just shocked to realize this level. It's been, it's been fun and it's been amazing. I'll never do, I, I'm sure I'm never, never going to go back because it, Let's think briefly about the kid who did, the kid who went to the fifth floor and stole that uh, poster. Those posters we show, those are the kind of posters you bring home as a, as a souvenir. Somebody asked him, and, they, and he was a warm beer. And he, uh, a, year, a year after we were there, he had grabbed the poster. They, he was spotted in the security cameras on that floor and uh, stopped at the airport on the way out. They found the poster and he was, he was uh, convicted of a theft of government property and sentenced to 20 years. And after years and years of a negotiation and, and concern, about two or three years later, he was released, but he was brain dead. Either he'd been, um, he'd uh, tried to make an escape or they, they had just had beaten him. And uh, he died within a few days of, of arriving home. Uh, he was just a kid. He, he, did some, he did something stupid that in almost all any place in the world would get a shouting at or something, but whoever brought him to North Korea hadn't told him the facts of life. Enjoy. Well, there's things written and then some more things on my website, uh, jamesoberg.com. There's, there's a, a section on North Korea with more pictures and uh, uh, more of the changes they've made to the pads and all the money they've spent on memorials and on new control centers, each one is like a new building. Uh, the one in one in Pyongyang, they built a control center for the space program, for the space satellites. And uh, the, the news coverage of it, the Western news coverage of it, again, totally misses the whole point of it. They, they described it as, as, a, as a very modern and efficient site uh, surround, you know, uh, surrounded by parking lots. Parking lots. Who in North Korea needs a parking lot? They they walk to work. They they may there were there may be a bike shed, but the the, the flat areas around it are to put hundred thousand people in a crowd in front of that where the where the viewing gallery where where Kim would stand after after a successful space shot, raise his arms and be and be cheered by the population. That. In the end, that's the kind of thing that they would spend the money on. They, they spend it on other projects as well. The fact that it might also pay off in a, in a terrible weapon system is, is absolutely crazy. Um, except that they've shown that level of craziness. They, they've shown that that level of craziness is the norm over there. Hey, Jim, I got a question for you. Hey. If uh, I was wondering if you noticed if they had the barbed wire at the top of the fences around the facilities pointing inwards, like in uh, in Ergia and and uh, some of the places like that in Russia. If you figure it out, well, on Russia, I, I watched. Yeah, you know, the Russian security stuff is really <laughs> pissant stuff compared to North Korea. I mean, in Russia, you can even roll under some of their security fences there because they're only like two, two or three feet off the ground because of, of they need to be able to put snowplows under them. <laughs> Seriously, I, mean, I got pictures of me doing that, and I, and I could do it over there because if I was caught, it, it, it was it was not the kind of treatment I get in North Korea. But uh, uh, no, I didn't see which way the wire was. I didn't see barbed wire. Uh, I can check. I took a lot of pictures, um, but the uh, the uh, security there is in the minds of the of the of the subjects of that regime. Uh, they there was. The regime areas where people were, where the regime employees and their, the families live, are behind secure, behind guarded areas. They're they're behind fences. They're 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 gated communities with soldiers guarding them on the way in. Um, so they they again they live in areas 
to protect them from a population which supposedly is totally loyal. Hmm. Yeah, we we got the so explanation. We got the explanation in Russia that the barbed wire pointed in to keep any spies that got in to make it harder for them to get out of the facility rather than making it harder for them to get in in the first place. Or also the alternative explanation to keep the engineers that they had um, told that's what they were going to work on in the facility. <laughs> Oh, they're that, or they just put it, put it in backwards. Yeah. <laughs> no, they're, they're, I mean, there's, but the, 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 the fences, the fences in Russia, there's fences around their own VIP housing, especially at Cosmonaut, at uh, Star City. There's, uh, there's about 30 or 40, what they call dachas, or co not dachas, but cottage, cottage, owned by the top cosmonauts and officials. And they're, they're behind barbed wire, but this is back in the 90s. You know, two dollars could get you could get you through but the guard the guard would say be sure to get back by four o'clock because i got off duty and if you can't if, if you if you can't be back there's a hole in the fence just down the road here uh and so many of the things that we got about those those, those russian cottages that's a whole other story i've never been there i would not go in there because i uh, it's not so much that the government would be against you; it's that there are there are wealthy people who would not like you to do that, and they and they would not arrest you. So we Any are, other uh, questions for for Jim Jim Overt. Thank you, guys. I have a a question or comment. Back in, I, it was either late 70s or very early 80s, my father was working law enforcement in Northeast Mississippi and the FBI came over looking for a man. And they told my father that uh, they needed this man because he had threatened to destroy a US city. Of course, my father kind of chuckled and he said, well, this guy had worked in, uh, in the, I guess, Air Force, but one of the military forces and he knew about satellite grids. And, he, and the FBI says, and you don't know what's up there. And my father said, well, I guess I do now. And he went out and found the guy and, and the FBI took him. He went in with the FBI. But it, when, I, when my father told me that story, yeah, I found it very interesting when we talk about threats from the outside, when anyone who has had training in satellite tracking, satellite communication, that goes off the deep end, could actually set up a grid on the ground that communicate with them. That's its own threat in itself. Fortunately, I think we don't have armed weapons in orbit to uh, do that. And you wouldn't want to keep up there too long. The, the scary part about the North Korean launch, that launch is that an accident of geography and get, get the globe out and go south out into a sun synchronous orbit out of, out of North Korea. And you can write up, you come come around go over in the Arctica, up the west coast of South America, across the Caribbean, and up up uh, across the U.S. but the U.S. Uh, mainland around Virginia or Maryland, and you're and you're basically tracking be between Washington D.C. and Camp David, and uh, but you're still in line of sight with the with the Havana Embassy. Uh, it, that could all be coincidence. Well, Jim, when you got back from uh, that visit, did the FBI or CIA or anyone uh, debrief you? I was surprised that they didn't, uh, because at a certain point, I don't. I I enjoy talking to people about the subject, and uh, I get a lot more information about their question from their questions they ask than they, they get from me. Uh, I, I'm presuming that because they didn't, they weren't interested in, in the pictures and, or anything uh, that uh, they had. A better source on the group in the group and uh there were two other people i knew there uh at least who would who would have been uh, would have been helpful yep no i and i would i would yeah, i would I, if i said if there was someone had i'd, I'd say I, would, I can't talk about it but no i i can say no no one did okay thanks Wait. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, folks. Okay. Yeah, Jim. Uh, thanks a lot. So, you know, uh, David, yeah, I guess you can stop the recording now.
Thanks again, Jim, for a fascinating discussion. It's good to go along with me. Uh, uh, our, our next uh, first Thursday meeting will be held in a month on March the 3rd. And Bob Mitchell, who's the president of the uh, Bay Area 